I had to use a strategy versus the seventh gym leader that involved me only using one Pokemon, and it wasn't to show off. The best strategy to beat the gym was one where I genuinely had to use only one Pokemon. If I used any more, the strategy would fail. But I'm getting ahead of myself right now. Let's start from the very beginning. This is a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Fire Red where I can't use evolutions or single stage Pokemon. Additionally, powerful unevolved Pokemon like Scyther or Chansey are banned for me too. A Nuzlocke is the most popular way to challenge yourself in a Pokemon game and I decided to take it a step further. The rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke are in the description below or you can pause the video here. Generation 3 is one of the hardest generations to little lock in because many boosting items don't exist yet. Unevolved Pokemon are always going to be weaker and slower and there are no boosting items like Choice Band, Choice Specs, or Choice Scarf available for the run. Furthermore, Toxic Spikes don't exist yet so there are no easy stall strategies versus Gym Leaders and Elite Form members. Also, we are picking Fire Red instead of Leaf Green for a very specific reason. Fire Red doesn't have Staryu. If you've watched my previous runs, you'd know that Staryu is an amazing Pokemon because of its high speed and good move pool. I am playing Fire Red so that it's tougher because I don't have access to one of the best Pokemon. But first, feel free to subscribe. Most of you are not subscribed and it's free to do so and helps out the channel. If I see a lot of likes and new subscriptions, then I know to keep making more videos. We start off in Pallet Town and I pick Bulbasaur because in the short term Misty is incredibly tough to deal with and Bulbasaur is my best bet. In general, most of my decisions are going to be based around the late game because inherently that's when unevolved Pokemon face the most difficulty, but Kanto is unique in that strong evolved Pokemon gym leaders start right from gym 2. Versus my rival, I keep tackling but I'm not actually strong enough and I lose the battle. Bulbasaur is certainly one of the Pokemon of all time and for the first time I begin attempt 2. I almost lose again, but Bulbasaur barely makes it through. The early game is mostly trivial. I catch a Rattata first and unfortunately it doesn't have the Guts ability. Guts is a great way for unevolved Pokemon to boost their power enough to be viable. In particular, Guts normal types are even better because they have the deadly Guts facade combo. Unfortunately we don't get it here. Then we catch Sparrow, Pidgey and Weedle before heading to the first gym. Brock is easy because we have Bulbasaur and a couple of Vine Whips are enough to beat him. Then we catch Mankey, Zubat and Ekans. Unfortunately Ekans does not have Intimidate. Intimidate is one of the best abilities in Nuzlocke's overall and Little Locks in particular because an automatic way to lower attack is a great way to compensate for the lack of defenses my unevolved Pokemon have. But now we have the first real challenge, Misty. Generally speaking, my strategies in the late game must be very close to a 100% win. Otherwise, it's not worth the risk of having to reset. But early game, because resetting is less painful to do, I can afford to use strategies that are very likely to work, but not necessarily 100%. I have a person berry for water plus confusion, but things can go wrong here. I can get critical hit and Starmie can dodge leech seed. The reason I leech seed first is that in the worst case scenario, I can sacrifice some of my bad Pokemon like Weedle, because leech seed causes damage every turn even when I'm switching around. In the end though, I'm the one who gets lucky and I critical hit the Starmie to get the second gym badge. Next up is the rival fight and it's not too bad. I just have to be aware of Charmander getting a critical hit while in blaze range. Pidgey damages Charmander but never puts it in the red and then Sparrow finishes it off. Now we enter the route where we can catch Abra. Abra is a great Pokemon for a little lock with its high special attack, but more importantly, the Kanto region doesn't have any dark type Pokemon. Dark and Steel were only introduced in Generation 2 and as a result, Psychic types are extremely good in the Kanto region. Catching Abra is so important to me that I don't want to risk it running away. Instead, I delay my encounter here until I get a Pokemon with Taunt. If I get a Pokemon with Taunt, then I can stop Abra from using Teleport and I can catch it like a normal Pokemon. I catch Oddish in Route 5 and I could have done this before Misty but I decided it wasn't worth it because it doesn't get a good grass type move anyway and I would prefer to beat Misty first to increase the level cap before fighting the rival. Then I catch Meowth and get a Citrus Berry which can be valuable later. The only other way to get a Citrus Berry is from using Thief on Wild Raticate. I get the Old Rod and catch a Magikarp in Vermilion City, Diglett in Diglett's Cave and then a Drowsy in Route 11. As I mentioned before, Psychic types are pretty overpowered and over the course of the game I'm going to be fighting a few Alakazams. 
Drowsy has a high special defense and is going to be an important natural counter to the Alakazams that I'm going to fight. Then we fight our rival for the third time and the main problem is going to be Raticate who has a strong Hyper Fang and we don't have anything that can take it on. We beat Pidgeotto with Sparrow but then, because nothing can take a critical hit Hyper Fang, we have to sacrifice a Pokemon to Raticate. I sacrifice Ekans and then go to Mankey who knocks out the Raticate. Drowsy shuts down the Kadabra and then gets a little lucky to beat Charmeleon too. The original plan was to use Diglett to beat Charmeleon, but this works too. Lieutenant Surge looks like a pushover because of Diglett with Dig, who can easily destroy the electric type gym. Dig is preferred over magnitude just to avoid the chance of multiple weak magnitudes and for that reason I also have a cherry berry to avoid static. But the Raichu can be a nightmare if it gets off enough double teams. I don't have time to waste with Dig, so I have to use Magnitude. Raichu gets hit by one Magnitude, dodges the next one, but not the other, and we get the third Gym Badge. If Diglett missed a Magnitude again, I would have had to use Bulbasaur and Oddish. Of course, they can miss every attack too, but the odds are extremely low of Raichu double teaming through that many Pokemon. Now we catch Voltorb in Route 10 and Machop in Rock Tunnel. I would have preferred a Geodude here, because I still don't have anything that can switch into normal types like Raticate. Ideally, I don't want to have to sacrifice a Pokemon every time I fight one. I skip the encounters for now in routes 8 and 7 because I can guarantee to catch a Growlithe there. Growlithe is amazing because it either has Intimidate or Flash Fire, two very good abilities. But Growlithe has Roar which can stop me from catching it. Just like Abra, I delay the encounter until I have a Pokemon with Taunt. I catch a Dodo in Route 16 and then go to the Team Rocket hideout. But I don't go there to fight anybody. I go there to get the Taunt TM and teach it to Voltorb, my fastest Pokemon. With Taunt Voltorb in hand, I go to Route 8 and get Growlithe which fortunately has Intimidate. If it didn't have Intimidate, I would have ignored the encounter and tried again in Route 7. Basically a 75% chance to get Intimidate Growlithe. But even if I didn't, Flash Fire would have been good too, but definitely Intimidate is better. Then I head to Erika's gym who is easy with flying types and I equip various berries to help versus a different powder move. We use the combination of Zubat and Sparrow to easily take down our Pokemon and get the 4th Gym Badge. Kanto's level curve is weird and brings our Pokemon up to a maximum of level 43. This is important for Giovanni and his Kangaskhan. As you might remember, we didn't get Geodude and we currently have nothing that can switch into normal type attacks. More specifically, we don't have anything that can switch into Kangaskhan's Mega Kick. But because we can build a level advantage, the fight becomes a lot more manageable. The first few Pokemon are easy and then the Kangaskhan comes in. The plan was to either Sleep Powder or sacrifice a Pokemon to bring in Mankey to get an attack off. Then sacrifice another Pokemon to bring in Machop to get an attack off. Fortunately that all becomes moot because Mankey gets a critical hit on the Kangaskhan. I was expecting to sacrifice two Pokemon versus Giovanni but I was able to come out without losing anything. Because of our level advantage, the rival in Pokemon Tower is easy and we finish him off. Then I use a Repel Manipulation strategy to get a Ghastly. If I repel with a level 18 Pokemon, it means Cubone, which was always below level 18, will never be encountered and I can guarantee to encounter a Ghastly. We have to beat the Snorlaxes that block the way, but there's a really interesting mechanic here. Exclusively with the Item Finder, you can get a Leftovers on the locations where Snorlax was. For now though, we have to wait. You can only get the Item Finder after catching 30 Pokemon, and we only have 19 for now. Leftovers could be an important item later in the run. Now that we have Taunt Voltorb, we go to Route 24 to catch a Caterpie. With the Caterpie, we can now guarantee to catch Abra in Route 25 because of Duplicate Clause. Unfortunately, the Abra has a Brave Nature which is quite literally the worst possible nature. This is a problem as it means Agatha from the Elite Four and her Gengars could become an issue if I can't outspeed them. Now I get the Super Rod and then get Horsey in Route 12. Remember, there is no Staryu in Fire Red. In the Safari Zone, I use the Repel Manipulation Strategy to either get Execute or Rhyhorn. I could get Scyther or Chansey too, but I ban them from the run because they'd make the game too easy. Unfortunately, the Rhyhorn runs away before I can catch it. Next we have Koga, the Poison type Gym Leader, who is easy with Abra except for Muk. Muk has high special defense, which means it won't die in one hit, and Minimize, which means that it can start dodging attacks. For that reason, I bring Abra pre-damage to the fight. That way Muk will never go for Minimize because the AI will always go for the KO if it thinks it can do it. I switch in Caterpie to sacrifice it and then I go to Magikarp. 
Flail Magikarp gets sacrificed but does enough damage to Muck that Abra can come back in and get the KO for the 5th Gym Badge. Now that we have Surf, a lot of encounters open up. We get Magnemite in the Power Plant, Tentacool on Route 19, Shelter on Cinnabar Island, a Goldene in Fuchsia City, and a Psyduck in Seafoam Islands. Then we have the Silphco Rival Fight, which is the first time we're fighting a diverse team of powerful Pokémon. Lead Voltorb beats Pidgeot, and because of how the AI works, it brings in Gyarados who loses too. Gyarados doesn't even die in one hit because of its high special defense, but its best move is Dragon Rage which isn't good enough. Dodo switches in and beats the Execute with a powerful Drill Peck, and up comes Alakazam. Remember when I said there'd be a lot of threatening Alakazams? Well this isn't one of them, because its only attacking move is Future Sight. We switch in Horsey and take advantage of an interesting mechanic. Future Sight cannot critical hit in Generation 3. Horsey vs Alakazam is not a fair fight and Horsey will take around 90% of damage. But because we're always safe, we can use Rain Dance and Surf to knock out the Alakazam. Charizard comes in next, but because of Swift Swim, Horsey outspeeds and knocks out the Charizard and we defeat the rival. Outspeeding Charizard was important because otherwise, if it gets a critical hit on Horsey, it can defeat the entire team. Now we have Giovanni again, but Ghastly turns it into a complete joke. Giovanni's Kangaskhan was incredibly threatening before, but it only knows normal type moves and as a result, Ghastly completely walls it. Horsey beats the lead Nido Reno and then we bring in Ghastly. Nido Queen can barely touch Ghastly at all and we can slowly but surely beat it down with Nightshade. Using the Giga Drain TM, we one hit KO Rhyhorn and Kangaskhan is left to die versus a Ghastly that it cannot touch. We do run into PP issues because Giga Drain only has 5 PP in Generation 3, but if I did run out, then Magnemite could have gotten the remaining damage. We move on to Sabrina, who is really tough, but not only because of the Alakazam. Alakazam is no joke, but the problem is also Mr. Mime, who can boost with Calm Mind and Barrier and Baton Pass into that Alakazam. That means there has to be a sense of urgency, otherwise even my Drowsy can't handle the Alakazam. I lead with Diglett who always knocks out Kadabra because of the low defense step. Mr. Mime comes in next and would normally start using Barrier. But because Diglett is pre-damaged, Mr. Mime will always use Psybeam and go for the KO. I sacrifice Weedle and then bring in Dodo. Dodo knocks out the Mr. Mime with return and I couldn't lead with Dodo because it's not fast enough to outspeed Kadabra. Only Diglett was capable of doing that. Venomoth comes in next and Dodo knocks that out too. Alakazam comes in now, but because it didn't get any support from Mr. Mime, Shadow Ball Drowsy is able to win the 1v1 and we get our 6th Gym Badge. We catch a coughing in Pokemon Mansion and head to Blaine, the 7th Gym Leader, a Fire-type trainer. This isn't actually an easy fight. We do have a few Water types, but they all have low base stats and could die to strong attacks from Arcanine and Rapidash, especially when you count critical hits. For example, Tentacle would die to 2 takedowns from Arcanine. Instead, the best strategy for Blaine is to actually bring only one Pokemon because it leads to a 100% guaranteed win. We bring a Rost Berry, Rain Dance, Swift Swim Horsey only. The strategy is very easy. Use Rain Dance and then use Surf because in Rain, everything is outsped and dies in one hit. The reason we have to bring only one Pokemon is because the lead Pokemon Growlithe has Roar which can roar out the Horsey as I use Rain Dance. That would waste valuable turns of rain and things become more problematic as I end up in a position where I'm vulnerable outside of rain and may have to sacrifice Pokemon. By bringing only one Pokemon, I can't be roared out and I have full control of my rain turns to just spam Surf and get the 7th Gym Bench. The Sevi Island stuff is relatively unimportant and I skip most of it and go for the 8th Gym Bench. If you were expecting some sort of grand finale for the 8th Gym Leader and Mafia Dawn, you're not going to get it here. Ghastly basically walls every Pokemon he has and he's no more of a challenge than Brock. With that, we're ready for the Elite Four. All we have left is one more rival fight. The rival is a threat and we have to use rain strategies to defeat him. We lead with Horsey and use Rain Dance versus Pidgeot. Then we switch out to Magnemite. With the accuracy boost of rain, we can use Thunder Magnemite to one hit KO the Pidgeot. Charizard comes in next and we have to sacrifice a Pokemon to the mighty Charizard. But now we go back to Horsey and we've timed the rain so that we have exactly one turn left to outspeed and knock out the Charizard. Next is Execute who doesn't have a Psychic type move anymore and its only attacking move is Solar Beam which makes Zubat an easy switch in. 
Interestingly, the AI is smart enough to recognize how bad of a matchup Solar Beam Execute is versus Zubat, and if you wing attack with Zubat, there's a chance that the AI switches to Rhyhorn. That's why we have to mean look first, to prevent Execute from switching out. Things become a little sweaty with paralysis, but Execute would have needed to win the lottery to actually beat Zubat. Alakazam comes in next, and I plan to sacrifice Zubat to Alakazam to bring in Drowsy safely. Drowsy isn't an immediate switch in because of how strong Alakazam is. It can actually break through Drowsy's high special defense with critical hits. For whatever reason, Alakazam keeps going for Future Sight, and I get more damage that I don't really need, but won't complain about either. Drowsy gets critical hit, but I can live and one hit KO the Alakazam back. This is what playing around the crit really means. If I had tried to preserve Zubat, this run could have ended completely. I plan to sacrifice Drowsy here because I already have an idea for the champion's Alakazam, but the AI decides to go for Rock Blast and doesn't hit the attack, which means Drowsy gets to live. I directly switch Voltorb into Gyarados because it will never die to a critical hit, and then I one hit KO with an electric type move, beating the rival. Victory Road isn't too eventful and we reach the entrance to the Elite Four easily. But first we have some preparations to make. You may have noticed that I didn't get an encounter in Celadon City. That's because I wanted to get a Porygon for the Elite Four and because I didn't need it before. I waited until the end so I have the least amount of grinding for money to get it. There's a few more preparations I have to make but as a plot device I'm not going to reveal them now and I'm instead going to unleash it suddenly in the battle. The first Elite Four member is Lorelei who leads with Dugong. My lead Voltorb is easily able to defeat Dugong and that baits in Cloyster. However, Cloyster's only attacking move is Dive. I can take advantage of this and go to Calm Mind Protect Abra. By alternating between Calm Mind and Protect, I can eventually max out my special attack. But there is one problem, I don't have anything to hit Jinx. Shadow Ball is a physical move and the punch moves like Fire Punch aren't available yet. Even at max special attack, there's a chance that Psychic does not KO Jinx and Jinx can hit me back in return. I do have a Chesto Berry in case it goes for Lovely Kiss, but a critical hit attack would knock me out. So what I do is I use Skill Swap to take Cloyster's ability. Cloyster's ability Shell Armor means it can never be crit. With the support that Cloyster has generously given me, Abra can now take on the Jinx without being scared of getting critical hit. But as luck would have it, Abra does have a chance to KO the Jinx and it ends up doing so, which means this whole critical hit scenario doesn't even come into play. Good for me, and with max special attack, the rest of the fight is easy and we clean up the first Elite Four member. Bruno is known for being easy, but it gets a little tricky here. Abra beats the first four Pokemon no problem, but it doesn't one hit KO Machamp. Instead, we have to use a PP stall strategy to defeat the Machamp. By alternating between Ghastly and Shelter, we can run Machamp out of Cross Chop PP. Because Shelter has Shell Armor, it's never at risk of a crit. It's annoying to have to go through PP stall strategies, but the payoff is worth it. Once we run Machamp out of Cross Chop PP, we can use Magnemite to defeat Machamp because Machamp's only attacking move left is Rock Tomb. The AI is unlikely to use Rock Tomb anyway because it doesn't like to use speed lowering moves when it's already faster. Metal Sound makes sure to avoid any complications like Citrus Berry or Full Restore and Magnemite is able to one hit KO the Machamp and we beat the second Elite Four member. But now it only gets tougher and we have one of the most challenging trainers of the run, Agatha and her Gengars. If my Abra had the speed to outspeed Gengar, this would have been a lot easier, but I have to find out my own new strategies now. The first Gengar is obnoxious to deal with because of Double Team. We paralyze with Thunder Wave and get a little damage off with Voltorb. Then we switch Shelter into Gengar to take it on and get a little bit of damage off too. We don't want to trigger a full restore, so we use the weaker move in Ice Beam to get Gengar in the yellow. Then we switch to Porygon who takes a Toxic and then finishes off Gengar with Psybeam. Golbat comes in next and I Psybeam to get a little damage on the Golbat too. Golbat can KO Porygon with anything which means it's going to go for a random move. All AI can be manipulated except random AI. I first go to Magnemite to take whatever hit Golbat goes for. Then I switch in Voltorb because now Golbat will never go for a poison type move versus Magnemite and I don't have to risk dying to a poison fang critical hit. Voltorb outspeeds and knocks out the Golbat, and this brings in Arbok. Arbok has a very strong sludge bomb and I want to avoid getting hit by it. Similar to what we did versus Golbat, we switch in Magnemite on the Arbok. This ensures that Arbok will never use a poison type move versus Magnemite and it will never use an Iron Tail either because of the resistance. 
Knowing this, we switch to Abra who can live even a critical hit bite. Abra outspeeds and knocks out the Arbok with Psychic. Gengar comes in next who does outspeed Abra and has powerful moves like Shadow Ball and Sludge Bomb. Chestoberry Magnemite can switch into the Gengar and then beat it 1v1. I Thunder Wave it first, that way if I get unlucky, at least the Gengar is paralyzed and something else can KO. I use Metal Sound a few times until I can guarantee to KO Gengar. Once it's in range, I throw off a Thunderbolt to knock out Gengar and Haunter comes in next. Fortunately, Haunter's only attacking moves are Dream Eater and Curse, so I can switch in Abra and beat it comfortably. And with that, we now move on to the last of the Elite Four. We lead with Ghastly who has Thunderbolt and can knock out the Gyarados. The order of operations is very important here. Lance's dragons are some of the most powerful Pokemon in the game and very few things can one-hit KO it, and very few things can even live in Outrage. Any Pokemon could have used an Electric-type attack to knock out Gyarados, but I specifically used Ghastly that way it baits an Aerodactyl. For my strategy to tame the dragons to work, I need to leave all the dragon types to the end. I switch in Magnemite to Aerodactyl because Aerodactyl doesn't have Earthquake and can't really touch Magnemite. Using the same Thunder Wave Metal Sound strategy that I used versus Gengar, we're able to cleanly defeat the Aerodactyl with our Magnemite. Now Dragonair comes in and it's time for the show. Before the Elite Four, I went to the Move Relearner and taught Porygon Conversion. Conversion changes Porygon's type to the type of a random move in its moveset. Then, before this fight, I taught Porygon Ice Beam. If I can change to the Ice type, then I get a same type attack bonus to my Ice Beam and that gives me enough power to one-hit KO the Dragonites. I directly switch Porygon into Dragonair who can't really touch me. I have recovered to heal off damage and even two critical hits won't KO me because of that. I set up an agility versus the Dragonair as it struggles to do damage versus me and then I try to use Conversion. Conversion randomly picks a type that you aren't already are from your moveset. In this case, I have two normal type moves and I'm already a normal type. This means I have a 50% chance to convert to an Ice type and a 50% chance to convert to a Psychic type. If I convert to a Psychic type, then I again have a 33% chance to convert to an Ice type and a 67% chance to convert back to a normal type. Because I can endlessly recover versus Dragonair, I can keep trying until I get the Ice typing. Once I get the Ice typing, it's game over. Porygon can one-hit KO all the dragons, and because I used agility earlier, I outspeed all of them too. Dragonair gets crushed, and the mighty Dragonite falls to an Ice-type Ice Beam, and we beat the final Elite Four member and are now ready for the champion. Versus the champion, once again, the order of operations is very important. I want to beat the Pidgeot with Voltorb, that way it baits in the right on next. If I beat Pidgeot with Magnemite, it would bait in Charizard instead. However, I can't lead with Voltorb to do that because the AI is smart. When I attack once and don't KO it, it might switch to Rhydon directly. What I have to do is I have to lead Magnemite to Metal Sound and then switch to Voltorb. With Metal Sound, I'm able to KO Pidgeot with Voltorb and successfully bring in Rhydon. Rhydon uses Earthquake and I switch him to Shelder who is immune to critical hits. Rhydon is really slow and Shelder outspeeds and knocks it out with Surf. This baits an Executor who is the crown jewel of the champion strategy. The plan is to PP stall Executor. Protect Shelter can waste a few PP of Giga Drain, but then we sacrifice Abra and bring in Ghastly. Because Executor can't touch Ghastly, it can continue to PP stall with Spite until it runs Executor out of Sleep Powder PP and out of Giga Drain PP. Then we keep Nightshading until the champion uses his two full restores to keep Executor alive. But our goal isn't just to take down Executor. It's a lot more than that. We also want to take out the Alakazam that comes in afterwards. We Toxic Executor and slowly bring it down to low health. Then, before it dies, we use Destiny Bond. The way Destiny Bond works is that it lasts one full turn, from Ghastly's current move to its next move. Executor faints from Toxic and Alakazam comes in next. But because Alakazam outspeeds Ghastly, one turn hasn't finished yet because Ghastly hasn't made its move. Destiny Bond is still active, so when Alakazam, arguably the best Pokemon in Kanto, knocks out Ghastly with Psychic, it also knocks itself out. Alakazam was a huge threat and now it's gone with only one sacrifice. We lead Voltorb coming out of the break and knock out the Gyarados. Finally, there's one Pokemon left and it's one of the best. We don't have Horsey on the team for Swift Swim strategies, so we need to find another way. 
I paralyze it with Voltorb and then sacrifice the Voltorb. The reason I don't attack is because the champion saves one full restore for the Charizard and I don't want to attack it into full restore range and accidentally lose the paralysis I inflicted. For the same reason, I don't attack it with a super effective Pokemon like Magnemite. Instead, I go to Porygon and attack it with Ice Beam to get a little damage off. Again, I'm very careful about doing too much damage and just keep using conversion as a way to waste time until I die. Finally, I go to Shelder and with the damage from Ice Beam, Shelder's explosion knocks out the Charizard and we become the champion with one Pokemon left, Magnemite. That's it for this Fire Red Nuzlocke. I had a lot of fun making it and my personal favorite strategy was the strategy for the 7th gym. Let me know what your favorite strategy was in the comments down below and thank you for watching. Also, if you like this video, check out my Emerald and Heart Gold Little Locks too.